Thank you, Nancy. And welcome everyone. It is so great to see so many dear friends here, uh, and especially friends of Nettie's. I thought of a couple of things to say at the beginning of uh, this meeting, and then I just scrapped them all. A picture says it all. If you see this picture of Nettie, to me at least, it expresses it all. It's so lovely. Um, what a beautiful moment in time, and what a fitting way for us to commemorate and celebrate. My name is Marcus Covert. I'm the bishop of this congregation, where Nettie was a long time and dearly beloved member. And I'm also joined up here by Elder Dow Wilson, who's representing uh, the area. So we'll start with, um, with an opening hymn. I want to thank Nancy Tamander and Phyllis Thay for uh, helping us with the music today. And again, what a perfect way to start this meeting. It's There is Sunshine in My Soul Today, hymn number 227. After that, we'll have an opening prayer by Nettie's granddaughter, Lindsay Ramirez. Our dear kind Heavenly Father, we're grateful to be here to gather together as friends and family on this beautiful day that Thou has given us. We ask that there will be peace in our heart and sunshine in our souls today as we celebrate the life of Nettie, a mother, grandmother, great-grandmother. And we're grateful for all the blessings that Thou gives us in our lives and the knowledge that we have of eternal families and that, that this life is short and we will be together soon. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, Lindsay. We'll now hear um, a life story from Nancy Lowe. And then we will hear um, some remembrances from Janet Bice. And after that, we will hear a, um, a vocal solo by Becca Worthen, uh, Ave Maria, arranged by Laura Blanchard. So the interesting thing about this building is I've never, I was not, ever in this ward building. I think I came one time to visit. So it's interesting to me that I've always felt like being a member of the Palo Alto second ward, you know, you always remember that and it's, it's your home ward. And yet I've, I've never been in this building <laughs> except for funerals. So <clears throat> thank you, thank you for coming. Those of you who know Nettie, um, especially family. We love to see our cousins are here. Um, they've driven from the Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, I'm, I'm surprised there's still roads. So thank you, and friends who knew her. Uh, you know she was here. She was probably at the door greeting you, waving to you. Welcome, welcome, it's so good to see you, because that's just who she was. She just loved everybody. We were very blessed as a family, even an extended family, whether it was on our dad's side or our mom's side. She just, she loved everybody. She wanted to be related to everybody. <clears throat> In fact, if we were out somewhere shopping or even at church, and you kind of lost track of where mom was, um, if you turned around, you would see she was talking to somebody. And it never failed. She was asking them their family history, where they were from, you know, what their name was, and then telling them she was sure we were related. So that was just one of the endearing qualities that she had. But again, thank you for coming on this rainy, rainy day. Um, our mother passed away peacefully a month ago, December 13th, after falling and breaking her hip. Uh, if 
If you knew Nettie, she, like we did, she was sure she would live to be 100. Um, and she got pretty close. She was almost 99. And she was in perfect health, except she fell and broke her hip. And that was just too much for her. And we're quite sure that our dad was calling her home. Nettie, come on. It's been a long time. It's time. Come on. Come on, Nettie. Come on. And she finally uh, just, it was just too much to try to recover from that. So, of course, we miss her terribly, but we were so grateful to have that time with her. So I just want to share a, her, a little bit of her life. <clears throat> Nettie Margaret Fawcett Salson Wise was born on February 12, 1924 in Boise, Idaho, a little white house that belonged to her grandmother. And that house is still there, uh, which is interesting. And her parents, Inez Valentine and Jesse Fawcett, and they were young parents. They had two little girls, Nettie and Wyoma. And she, her beloved sister, Wyoma, did pass away a few years ago. The, her early years were spent in mostly in Utah and Idaho, traveling to wherever her father had worked. And she spent quite a few years in Echo Canyon, which is up above Ogden, where they were building the dam. And her parents uh, worked at a little restaurant for the workers. And she loved to tell those stories about uh, living in Echo Canyon. And they had a little lamb. Um, and, and we even have a picture of that little lamb, and she would talk about how it was their favorite pet. And it finally got too big, and they would keep it under a wash tub, but it got too big and ran away. Probably the gypsies took it. So that's another story. That is uh, my, our Aunt Wyoming story. But um, she remembered that, that experience really fondly. Then after Echo Canyon, though, our, our grandparents were divorced, and so our grandmother, Inez, took Wyoma and Nettie and moved back to Boise, Idaho, to the same house that she was born in. And she was very, she, she recollects that she was very happy. The two girls were just doted on by this um, family of grandmothers and great-grandmothers that lived there. And when she was eight years old, in the Boise, chapel, it was a one-room chapel, just a, a, a wood one-room chapel, wood floors, wood benches, wood everything, no, nothing fancy. She remembers how she, when she was baptized, you just lifted the trap door in the floor. And there was a ladder that went down to, I don't know, a horse trough, I'm not really sure, but a pool underneath the floor where she was baptized. And she remembers that and how how impressed she was that she felt the spirit when she was confirmed. And from then on, that relationship with her savior was really important to her. And it, and it was her really her most important memory from uh, when she was baptized. Shortly thereafter, <clears throat> their mother married Harold Salson. Harold would come to Boise to visit his mother, who lived next door. Well, Harold lived in California, so he packed up the family and moved them to San Francisco. That was in about 1934. And of course, this is the Depression, and she would always talk about, we were poor, but everybody was poor. So you didn't know you were poor. And I thought that was really a, a great attitude to have, and it, again, just something that she carried through her whole life. <clears throat> they moved to San Francisco, and um, uh, 40, 46th Avenue, I think. Anyway, and she would talk about how her and Wyoma would roller skate. You know, and this is, this is good. You know, you all live here. You know what I'm talking about. Unlike when we live in Utah, you know, San Francisco. But you could roller skate down the hills to Golden Gate Park that way, the beach that way. Little roller skates with keys. And that was, they just had the greatest fun, just roller skating up and down. I don't think you can do that today in San Francisco. <coughs> but a great memory. And then she lived next door, they lived next door to the, to the Whedons. And Belle was their best friend. And Mr. Whedon was the zookeeper at Flyshacker. I mean, what a great job that would be. But he had a side hustle where he would come down to Woodside to, to an estate, um, you can Google this, 
uh, the George Whittle estate, and Mr. Whittle had a zoo of his own. And Mr. Whedon would bring the girls down to this estate, and they would go and visit all the, the lions and, and, I, and the tigers, and, and he had an elephant. And he would say to the girls, do you want to help give the elephant a bath? She just thought this was the best thing in the whole world that she could get in the swimming pool with the elephant. Now, I don't know if she really did, but um, she, she remembers that as being an amazing experience and they loved it. And she said the elephant's name was Gloria. <clears throat> and so she would, I mean, even when we were kids, she would tell us the story about Gloria the elephant. So around 1935, <clears throat> they moved from San Francisco to Redwood City um, and uh, I forget the street, Vera, Vera Avenue, Redwood <coughs> City, in a little, little tiny house that Harold and Inez lived in until they passed away, so for a long time. And she went to Sequoia High School, and she loved her high school, Go Go Cherokees. And even when she was in the ICU and trying to dodge therapy because she was not gonna stand up, and the therapist would try to help her, and she would just start singing Go Go Cherokees <laughs> and telling them the story about her high school. So when she was in high school, uh, of course, there was Sequoia and Pally. They were the only two high schools in between on the peninsula. And they would have high school dances, and that's where she met our dad, Bob. Bob Wise, who went to Pally. And of course, he was immediately smitten and in love with Nettie Wise. Oh, Nettie Salson. And, uh, but she, she was gonna, she was not having any of that. She wanted to play the field and date lots of boys. Um, but they did, they dated off and on through high school and then Pearl Harbor came and changed their lives forever. So dad graduates, he enlists in the army and he goes off to basic training and Nettie goes to San Jose State still unsure about, I'm not sure if I want to keep dating this cute boy because he was really good looking because of the war now, right? And so she, she dedicated herself to school. She studied speech and drama. She loved being in plays and doing dances. So if you wonder where that came from, that you know she's still dancing at 98 years old, that was something she really loved. She did, however, change her major later to something more serious childhood education, and uh, she wanted to be a preschool teacher. So in the meantime, Bob is writing her letters. You know, Nettie, I want you to wait for me. I love you. And she's dating other boys. She just was not serious. But then when she was 20, she took $300 out of her bank account and got on a train and went to Tampa, Florida, which is where our dad was in basic training. Well, that's cross country from here, all by herself, which was really kind of scandalous. She didn't go with a chaperone. Um, she stayed at a boarding house and would see dad at night and on the weekends after they would do their thing, you know, the army thing. And then he got his orders to ship out. And I, I think that was, that must have been a really difficult moment for her as she had to really contemplate that, you know, this was serious now, he was gonna leave. And um, so she came back to San Jose State and dad went off to Italy. And she continued to study and write him, not thinking she was serious at all. But then when dad got home after the war ended, he didn't tell her he was coming home and he calls her from his mom's house, calls her on the phone and she gets this. She was living at a sorority house. Nettie, there's a phone call for you. There's a call and she's like, Nobody calls me. Who's calling me? She gets on the phone, hello. And dad says, Nettie, can we get married now? <laughs> and she said, yes. I think obviously, you know, the relief that he got home safely must have meant a great deal to her. But they were in love, mad over heels. She knew that he was the one for her. And they were married December 21st, 1946 in the Stanford Mill Chapel and lived happily ever after. Later, mom and dad would be sealed in the Oakland Temple and to us as a family, and that was in 1964. And those of you from the 
the Palo Alto Second Ward will remember, there were actually a whole group of families that went. Uh, the Oakland Temple was new, um, and that meant a lot to us. We were thrilled about that. So early in mom and dad's marriage, they lived in a, just a junky apartment um, by Searsville Lake, and she would talk about how, oh, it was so terrible, and it just would shake in the wind, and, and an earthquake came, and she was getting in the shower when the earthquake, earthquake hit, and she just ran through the apartment. We have to move, we have to move, it's an earthquake. And so after that, it was, you have to buy us a house she would say to dad. So they did, uh, eventually they bought their first home in Menlo Park, we lived on 15th Avenue, and it was me and Jeff, and he's much older, just want you to know, like, a lot older. <laughs> but it was such a cute little house, and I remember it, a nice street, uh, and I, I remember it had a window, you know, it was kind of on the corner, and. And mom would just sit on this, um, the bench that was under the window and watch, watch out the window while we rode our bikes up and down the street. And then in 1956, we moved to 3790 Carina Way, Palo Alto, California. It's funny how you remember addresses like that. And it was a perfect little house. She loved it. We had a great yard. The fence in the back opened up to the Ortega Elementary School, which isn't there anymore. Um, and she loved it. She really made that her home, and it was always tidy and organized, and um, she, she just wanted us to, you know, be, be safe in our little neighborhood, and she was friends with everyone. Lifetime friends, the Spencers who lived down the street, lifetime friends, the Wolfsheimers on the corner, Tony Tosca and his little family. <clears throat> And that was a great place to grow up. Meanwhile, Jeff and I, we, we grow up and we get married and move on and start our families. Janet and Robert are little. <coughs> and <coughs> the Greens, the Greens had moved, they were in our ward, and the Greens had moved to Colorado and they came back and they said, oh, we wanna buy your house. And mom and dad were like, okay. So they impulsively sold their house to the Greens and we moved to Christine Drive next door to the Taylors. And it felt like we had lived there our whole lives because they, of course, were so warm and friendly and wonderful friends to mom and dad. <clears throat> so they lived there for a while and then dad moved his company to Fresno in 1976. Well, who wants to move to Fresno? Robert lives in Fresno. <laughs> it was hot. It was really hot there. But they actually moved to Clovis, this cute little town, this little farm town. Oh, it was a great house, and they had a pool and room for a horse and some cows. And, and Dad did say that, you know, it was hard to have a He was excited to have a cow, but if you name them, it's harder to eat them. <laughs> and Mom loved that. She loved the idea that they had this little, this little farm place. And she loved that we could come with our families, and she always made us welcome, spoiled us rotten when we would come. And it was like having our own little retreat with this, this pool. <clears throat> and of course, being in Clovis, she made quick order of serving in the Relief Society, being a friend to everybody. And I remember she would drive just hundreds of miles in that region, you know, doing, in the valley, doing Relief Society work. It was so important to her. <clears throat> well, dad retired and um, they moved back to Menlo Park. And then our dad passed away in 1998. And she will say that that was the saddest day of her life, was when dad, Bob, the love of her life, passed away. But she made quick order of settling back in. Um, the house in Menlo Park had belonged to our grandmother, grandma and grandpa wise. And so it was very comfortable for her. But even though she lived in Menlo Park, she still came to this ward. That was her home, Palo Alto Second Ward. I'm sorry, it'll never be the Foothill Ward. <laughs> and she was a faithful, faithful member. She loved the church. It, it was so important to her, and she had many callings, young women's. I remember when she would do Cub Scouts, um, and, and of course the Relief Society, her beloved Relief Society. And um, going through her things, 
of course, you know, there are wonderful cards and memories that people through the years have extended to her. Um, but one of the things I came across I want to I wanna read to you. So this was from her notebook. She kept notebooks, uh, journals and notebooks. She wrote in everything. At about 85-ish, I found I needed to simplify my activities. I realized I did not need to do anything I didn't or couldn't or shouldn't do. I physically almost had to hold down my arm when a volunteer was needed. <laughs> because that, that was mom. Even to the end, as she got older and older and her memory was failing, it didn't matter, she, was, she would hop up and do something. Let me help you, let me do that. And that's just as who she was. <clears throat> I thought that was really great. <clears throat> when she was 90, she was called to be in the Relief Society presidency in this ward. And as her daughters who lived far away, we were like, Mom, are you sure you want to do that? I mean, that really sounds like a lot of work, and maybe that'd really be hard for you. And she's like, oh, no, it'll be fine. I have to learn Google Docs. <laughs> so that was her big challenge. Uh, and she, actually, she did. She did pretty good. But it wasn't too long after that that she, we, we convinced her to move to Utah. It was just getting too difficult for her. And she reluctantly did come to Utah. Um, she, don't bury me in Utah, she would say. I, I, it's different here. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't matter that she would see the Taylor, she would see Marlene Mashinsky, and other people who would come and go that would you know, kind of make it feel like it was home. And she wasn't too far away, but nope, she was not having any of it. <clears throat> I need to go home. I need to go to California. So that's why we, you know, made the effort to obviously see that she was as happy as she could be there. She was surrounded by grandchildren, great grandchildren. She has almost 44 grandchildren, um, and half of them live here, half of them in Utah, and kind of various other places, Texas, Hawaii, New York, and, uh, but it didn't matter. They, she thought about them all the time. How are the kids doing? What are they doing? Where are they? And um, that was most important to her. She loved the beach. She loved camping at Big Basin. When we got a trailer, we would go up to the lake, which was up in the Sierra foothills, and she loved that. Dad loved the beach, too. She took trips and cruises. Most famously was her trip to Bali with her beloved sister, and she broke her leg. Slipped down the hotel stairs and broke her leg and had to fly home because she said, <laughs> she said, well, we went to the doctor and the doctors weren't wearing shoes. <laughs> she says, I can't have them fix my leg. They don't wear shoes. Which Josh, wherever you are, Josh had lived in Bali for a long time, so he can understand that. Um, <clears throat> and she came home had surgery on her leg to fix it, and my son Matt spent that summer with her. Um, so she was, she was always doted on. She loved that the grandkids could come and go. If you wanted to stay with her, you could stay with her. If you wanted to visit, you could visit any time. And, and she would cook for you, and if you wanted to go shopping, she would go shopping with you, whatever you wanted. Her home was your home. She took care of our grandmothers, she took care of people in the ward. She took care of neighbors. It was her thing. She's in the ICU, and she's telling, again, she's telling the therapist how she would help people at their funerals and that the mortuary wanted to hire her. <laughs> but mom, you know, for her great character traits of being loving and charitable and serving others, she was pretty hardcore. She did not let us get away with anything. And, um, you know, she, without even blinking an eye, she would just look, look at you, and you're not doing that. But she loved us and took care of us. She couldn't cook, she couldn't sew. We had a lot of cold cereal. Um, but we were loved and cared for. 
Um, she was a wonderful mother. But she did not baby you. She would, if we were bawling or whining or something, she would, you know, she would say, are you bleeding? <laughs> no. Stop it. <laughs> and I, I think that that was a real inner strength that she had, that sometimes it was, you know, you can do this. No matter how hard this is, you can do this. She was bold and unflappable, an amazing, amazing human. Strong-willed, educated, intelligent. She was very funny. We would have um, contests. She would want us to do jumping jack contests. And it never failed that we just would end up rolling laughing on the floor because for some reason she couldn't do them. <laughs> um, but we were the most important things to her. She believed that women could do whatever they wanted, not in a radical feminist kind of way, but a divine nature way. She knew that you women were daughters of God and had this enormous potential, and you could do whatever you set your mind to doing. But family always came first with her, and she was a preschool teacher. In Menlo Park, they even built a school for her so she could teach preschool. And she did that till I think, 1969. Um, and in her journal she wrote, I, I worked till 1969, but then my family needed me. Which, Jeff and I, we were ready to go, so it must have been Janet and Robert that were so needy. <laughs> so even though she was wildly independent, um, there, were, there were a couple of things that she just did not like doing. She did not like pumping gas or changing light bulbs. And that was a way that she could honor our dad, right? Like, because that's just how he took care of her. I will pump the gas. And she missed him terribly. So I, I had mentioned this already about the great-grandchildren and how everybody was you know, able to really spend time with her before she passed, except for my son, Andrew, who lives in Hawaii, and Lindsay, who's in Texas, Talmadge, who's in New York. It was a little challenging you know, at those last few months, but Everybody got to see her in the last few months, and that meant so much to her. And the great-grandchildren, one of her great talents was she, she could remember all these preschool songs, and she would sing them to the little kids. The Jump, Jump, Jumping song, which I, I don't know that song, um, and, and they would just gather around her, and she would sing that song to them the jump, jump, jumpy song. And it was great. And she would do that really right up until, you know, she broke her hip. She's in the ICU, and again, they're trying to get her to stand up or do something, take steps, and, or eat. And her, she would start reciting the Gettysburg Address. <laughs> You're not gonna make me stand up. You know, four score and 20 years ago. <laughs> And, and she just, so it was so amazing, in spite of her age and declining memory, she had this amazing memory of all these things that were very endearing. So a few years ago, I said to her, <clears throat> Mom, if there's one thing that you could say to the, the children, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren, if there's one thing you want them to know, one thing you would tell them, and I would include my cousins in this too, because you were her family, you were her extended family. She loved all of you so much. But I said, what, what is the one thing you would tell them? The one piece of advice? And she said, I thought she was gonna give me a big Dr. Laura speech or something. But she said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And that was it, just don't be afraid. And I'm sure there were times that my mother was afraid. She was, she was really, you know, worried about what was ahead as she knew she was declining. And she had a hard life. She had a lot of challenges, a lot of adversity. I'm sure there was times that she was afraid, but she, she would never let you know it. And that really, I think, kind of defined her life was don't be afraid. And, I, you know, she was the bravest person I know. She, she was the example of motherhood for me. She said her mother was the greatest influence in her life, and I would say she was the greatest influence in my life, and I know in Janet's as well. And we will miss her terribly. She was 
She was not perfect. None of us are. Um, but she was the perfect mother for us. And she was the mother we needed and wanted. So I, I want to thank you again for coming. Um, it, it means a lot to us. It means a lot to her. And I know she's here. Not just here, but here. And her family was the most important thing to her. And then the church. She had a, a deep testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so it's comforting for us to have faith and a belief in eternal families that we can be with her again. And we look, we look forward to that. I don't think it'll, you know, time is different here. It won't be long. Mom, you are engraven in our hearts forever. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Unlike Nancy, well, I guess like Nancy, I actually never like lived in this ward, but I have been in this ward a lot. Um, and I can still picture my mom sitting there on that back row with all the other women, older women in the ward. They had their own little place back there on that first row of chairs. And every time I came to church with her, we always were sitting right there. Um, <clears throat> my mom, obviously she was my mom, so I think she was the greatest person in the world. Um, she was just probably one of the kindest, most generous people, person. Um, and any, I think anyone who knew her or had met her felt that love that she had for everyone. And Nancy talked about the stories, uh, talked about how she always would stop everybody. And my dad was funny. He would always say, you know, oh, gosh, did you get their genealogy? Come on, we got to go. Stop with the meeting after the meeting. And um, I really feel like that was kind of the way he felt, you know, in this 25-year period waiting for, like, just stop talking. Can we go now? <coughs> um, but she truly loved Every person that she met, it didn't matter who they were. It didn't matter what nationality they were or what social standing they had or whatever, whoever they were. She loved everyone. And she made everyone feel important. Like, if she was talking to you, you were the most important person in her world right then. And she wanted to know everything about you, where you were from, what you do, what are your goals, what do you hope to accomplish in life? And um, she just, that was just her nature. I didn't inherit that trait. I am the quiet observer in the back row. But she was always wanted to be front and center and be the center of attention and talk to everyone and get to know everyone. She also had this uncanny ability to draw the little children to her. Didn't matter, again, where she was. Obviously, she was a preschool teacher for her entire adult life, and so she had an affinity for young children. But even children that she didn't know, even as kind of a scary 98-year-old woman sitting in the back row at church saying to the little kids, <laughs> And their mom's going, no, no. But they all would come. And the beginning of COVID, um, you know, everything shut down. And one of the things that she did was she would do story time every week for the little kids in our neighborhood. And they would just come and sit on our front lawn. And she would read stories and sing songs, and they loved her, and she loved them. Um, there's so many things, so many memories I have of her, and it's like, where do you start? What do you, what do you want to share? What do I want you to take away? And, but I think one of the most important things is that she loved each and every one of you that you had a part in her life and it was important to her and she remembered 
everyone. And she loved living in Palo Alto and she loved this ward. I, I used to tease her, that, called her that, you know, she was part of the Palo Alto royalty and she would kind of laugh at that, but I think she kind of felt that way that, you know, she was here from the beginning and these were her people and her friends and she had these great relationships and I can remember she uh, had this really tight group of friends and every year um, they would go to the beach together and as a little kid I was so jealous. What do you mean you're going to the beach and you're not taking me? <laughs> And as I got older, I wanted those kinds of friendships. I wanted this group of ladies that I could go to the beach every year and laugh with. And she just, it, she had friends from, that she had met in elementary school, that she was friends with her whole entire life, that not just Facebook friends, but I mean friends that she had dinner with or went to lunch with. And that group just kept growing and growing and growing as she got older. She just kept her friends. And I always felt like that was what an amazing quality and a, a great gift that was. She, um, she, was <laughs> she lived with me for almost eight years. And <laughs> it really was like one of the greatest blessings in my life because I got to know her on a different level. I got to see how really, really funny she was. As a kid growing up, she was funny to my friends, but not, uh, she was embarrassing to me. <laughs> she would make up songs. Anytime you get on the car, we went somewhere, I'd be in the car with my friends. Now imagine you're 12, 13 years old, and you're going to the mall, maybe just to the mall, and your mom starts singing, here we are on our way, going to the mall. <laughs> just like, my friends thought she was amazing, and they loved her, but I was embarrassed. But as I got older, and I could see that she sang those songs, not because she was a great singer, because trust me, she was not. <laughs> and my dad used to say, are you sure you're on the same page as the rest of us? <laughs> Singing the same song. <laughs> but it was that she just had so much joy. She just couldn't contain it. And so everything was joyful to her. So if you're going to have joy, then you're going to sing and you're going to dance and you're going to make up silly songs and play funny games and do funny things like think you're Tim Conway and put your... You go down to breakfast and there's your mother on her knees with a pair of shoes. <laughs> like she's a little tiny, she was short anyways, but just a little tiny scooting around getting her breakfast on her knees. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Whatever. My kids have great memories of going to grandma's house. If you went to grandma's house, you always had a little tiny can of apple juice and an even smaller can of root beer. <laughs> because you couldn't have, go to grandma's house without having a root beer float. But you never wanted to eat the cereal because we were never quite sure how long that cereal had been there because we we're pretty sure it had been there for the last five years. <laughs> um, she, uh, even, even at the, end of her life, those last two weeks where she was fading away, she had joy. She would make the people around her happy. Nancy talked about her singing songs to the therapists in the room, and the, the day before she passed away, this cute aide came to give her a bath, and she just did not want a bath. And she kept telling her, oh, no, just leave me alone. She goes, but I love you. I just want you to know I love you. I don't want a bath, but I love you. And um, <laughs> she, she tolerated living in Utah. And I, she made the best of this situation. She loved, you know, obviously loved being around the different side of her grandchildren. And... But California was always home, 
<laughs> I, I think it was like the day before she passed away and she's telling Jeff that she's dying and he better get the truck ready because she's not getting buried in, Cal in Utah. And then she says, what was God thinking when he made Utah? <laughs> Sometimes I wonder that myself. <laughs> but she, <clears throat> she had some really funny, funny stories of her life. And uh, <laughs> one of my favorite, it's, like, it's just such a visual, especially today where it's pouring rain. She's telling, she loves to tell this story about my dad had a business like event party up in San Francisco and it was at one of the fancier hotels you know that has the doorman and she said it was pouring rain just pouring rain and they got up up there and they got out of the car and the doorman opens the door and she steps into the lobby and just goes flat on her face and just slides across the hotel floor into the into the ballroom area <laughs> it's just like well, I'm here. <laughs> and um, I just, some of the things, you know, that I think, you know, would be uh, hard for me, she made easy. And she always made me feel like I could do anything, that there wasn't anything that I wanted that she felt like, oh, no, don't try that. She was like, just go for it, do it, try it. What's the worst thing that can happen? You decide you don't like it, but what if you love it? So just give it a try. And I always appreciated that support. And I appreciated her, her love and her kindness and her example that she was to me and her testimony. She just never wavered in, um, her testimony, Nancy talked about when she got baptized, and if you were to talk to her, she would tell you that when she got confirmed, she says, I knew from that moment on, and I, she says, I just felt this light, and I just knew that I was a daughter of God, and that he loved me, and I have never doubted that, and um, that was a great example for me. She was such a great example of loving her neighbor. She was always serving. In fact, one time I, uh, I called the church when we met on Gwenda and before cell phones. And Robert was sick. My dad was home, but my mom was at Relief Society. And I called the church and <laughs> I said I needed to talk to my mom. I was probably like nine. And, and she gets on the phone, and I was chastising her <laughs> and saying, why are you at church? Your family needs you. You should be here. Robert's sick. <laughs> and she's like, well, Dad's there, right? Yes. Is Robert crying? Is he throwing up? No. Okay, well, I'll be home in a few, in an hour. <laughs> Um, but that was, that was the way she was, that she, uh, she was a great mom, but she also lived her life to the fullest and served everyone that she met and loved everyone that she met and was just a, a joy to be around. And she, for a tiny person, she took up a big space and I am really going miss that. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Wow, that was amazing. Thank you, Becca and Laura. <laughs> Some of you might be wondering why Ave Maria. <laughs> um, my mother, my mother frequently wanted to talk about her funeral. She wanted to plan. And every time she talked about it, she said, I want Becca to sing Ave Maria. Because that, that was sung at her wedding in the Stanford Memorial Church. And so thank you, Becca. Thank you all for being here for all the people who helped to put this together, um, for the ward and all the work that went into this. We really appreciate it. Nettie, Nettie helped at a lot of funerals here, as Nancy mentioned. She, she loved the idea of getting people together and talking to them, the spirit that was there. The Relief Society has prepared a luncheon. She's been involved in a lot of those, and she would like to invite all of you to come have a little luncheon and look at the slideshow of pictures of her. She was an amazing lady. Um, when uh, so she, she fell Thanksgiving weekend, <laughs> broke her hip. She was getting more confused in life and having a broken hip and being on painkillers made her more confused. She would say, and why, now, why am I here? Because I broke my hip. How'd that happen? But as we prepared for surgery, um, we went up into the, to the surgical waiting area. And she had this, this moment where suddenly she seemed very lucid and clear. <laughs> and she said, it's going to be such a celebration. Wonderful. 
a wonderful party. I'll get to see Bob again, and my mother, and my sister. That'd be so great. And then she turned to Catherine and she said, and I'll, I'll see your mother. Catherine's mother passed away a year ago. I'll see your mother. And I'll get to see your sister. I never met your sister, but I'll get to see your sister. I'll get to know her. I'm looking forward to that. And that's when she said, I'm not being buried in Utah, so you better get the truck ready. <laughs> and then she got real serious and she said, I have always had I've always had a testimony of Jesus Christ. And the resurrection. She, uh, she lived life with great enthusiasm and she looked forward to the continuation of life in a different sphere where her hip wasn't broken and her hearing worked and her mind worked. She said, I must have hit my head really hard in the fall because I can't figure this out. She, um, she taught us a lot. There are four lessons that I want to leave with you. She lived with great faith. And she shared that faith with, with our family and with all of those that she, she met. My father wasn't a member of the church when they got married. Um, but she would take us to church. She made sure we got to church. She taught us the gospel. And later when my father joined the church, she, uh, she continued to, uh, to, to lead out in that. She was not a scriptorian. She didn't, didn't have a great uh, theological knowledge. She just had a basic, simple faith in Jesus Christ and in the plan of salvation and the restoration of the gospel. She believed those things and felt them deeply in her life. As you've heard from my sister, she taught us about service. She was... Uh, she was always serving. She was... <laughs> she... She... Uh, she fell. She fell once when she was 90. And they asked her, she got checked out in the ER, and they said, well, what were you doing when you fell? And she said, well, I was helping somebody move. I was packing boxes in the kitchen, and somebody had left something behind me, and I stumbled. She did not think that was remarkable, that at 90 years old, she would be helping somebody else move and packing up their kitchen. Um, when she went to Utah, she wanted to go to the bishop's storehouse and serve there. And she came back and said, they don't do it right. <laughs> she had a sense that overall, they didn't do things right in Utah. <laughs> and uh, and uh, always longed to come back here to Palo Alto. Um, and certainly not to be buried there. Um, she taught us about love. She loved everybody. She had this great expansive sense of love, of, of being related, connected to people. She looked for those connections. for me to be able to commemorate and celebrate Nettie with you all today and 
as we've heard, longtime member here, great lover of California. Um, when I asked my parents, who are here over Zoom today, when I asked them to describe Nettie, I'm kind of amazed how the first word was, was exactly what we just heard uh, Janet talk about in so much more detail, but really everyone, joyful. Joyful was the word she chose, and it just reminds me of this incredible definition we just heard of joy, which at least of my notes, it says, if you have joy, you'll sing funny things and dance funny ways, right? You'll do fun things, you'll be filled with light, you'll share it. My parents also added kind, always friendly to everyone. You've heard these things from the ones who knew her best. She was a ray of light, and it sounds like also a real firecracker. Um, but interestingly, one of the most important things we can know is just how deep her religious faith was. Uh, and of course, her faith that nourished and supported her through it all. I love this insight that joy, it's energy, it's positive energy. It doesn't come from nowhere. She worked to give that gift to all of us. She worked to give that gift to all of us. And, and this quote from her that Jeff shared, I have always had a testimony of Jesus Christ and the resurrection. One of the greatest things we can do to honor her and love her is to remember those truths that she held so dear, so sacred, that enabled her to radiate. The light, um, the light that she carried within, we had this first hymn, There's Sunshine in My Soul Today. Interestingly, it's pouring rain outside, right? It's pouring rain outside, but it's shining in here. And that light is the light of Christ. Living the principles of the gospel were the dynamo that generated that light, that generated that energy, that enabled us, her to give us what she did. So when I think about what life is going to be like for Nettie, how can we imagine where she might be now? What will heaven look like as she comes in? I have a favorite passage that I know some of you have heard me read before from Peace Like a River, which is a novel by Leif Inger, where one of the characters in the book ends up dying. But the book doesn't stop there. It has this beautiful description of uh, kind of using almost like an, an, an Appalachian metaphor for what happens. And I just love it. I wish I could read this whole chapter, but here is my favorite part. Just as this person passes away. And now, from beneath the audible came a low reverberation. It came up through the soles of my feet. I stood while it hummed upward, bone by bone. There is no adequate simile. The pulse of the country worked through my body until I recognized it as music, as language. And the language ran everywhere inside me like blood. And for feeling it was as if through time I had been made of earth or mud or other insensate matter, like a rhyme learned in antiquity, a verse blazed to mind. Oh, be quick my soul to answer him. Be jubilant my feet. And sure enough, my soul leapt, dancing inside my chest. My feet sprang up and sped me forward, and the sense came to me of undergoing creation, as the land and the trees and the beasts of the orchard had done some long time before, and the pulse of the country came around me as a voice is lifted at great distance, and moved through me as I ran until words came clear and I sang them with a beautiful and curious chant. I believe in and dearly hope for a heaven like this, for Nettie, especially if you throw in some roller skates, <laughs> as we heard before. I believe in a heaven that radiates with energy, that resonates with music, that pulses with compassion, that throbs with kindness. And I know you all do too. 
That's the beautiful hope we share as we come together in this way. I'll just close with one of the most beautiful stories in the New Testament, Christ raising Lazarus, recorded by John. Jesus came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor for he's been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. When he said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his, his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. We believe that this literally happened, that Jesus Christ raised Lazarus from the grave, that he has power over death, and that he will raise Nettie, and he will raise us. As the poet J.K. Chesterton says, the sages have a hundred maps to give. They trace their crawling cosmos like a tree. They rattle reason out through many a sieve that stores the sand, but lets the goal go, three, go free. And all these things are less than dust to me because my name is Lazarus and I live. Nettie, if you're with us today, which I believe you are, we want to thank you. Thank you for your kindness, your inclusiveness, your joy, your love of family and friends, your enduring faith. As you return to our eternal parents and heavenly family, may you remember how much we love and appreciate you here. May you reach out to children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren from time to time. May you continue to inspire and bless us in immortality as you've done so well in mortality. And to her friends and family, I pray that we can move forward knowing that she, as was mentioned earlier, that she stands ready to welcome us, to bring us in. She wants to be related to everybody and now she knows she is. Thanks again for letting me be part of this. I'm grateful for all of you, and I bear this testimony, praying for these things. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. We'll close with hymn number 220. Lord, I will follow thee. We'll have a closing prayer from Casey Gruel, the granddaughter, and then um, the luncheon will be in this direction, so I'll look forward to seeing you there.